You're tuned into the COVID-19 Community Report here on KDRT LP 95.7 FM in Davis, California. I'm Autumn Labbe Renault, and today is Tuesday, September 29th, 2020. We're sharing local news and resources, focusing on what's impacting Davis and nearby cities in Yolo County during the COVID-19 pandemic. My guests today are Jesse Salinas, assessor, clerk recorder, and registrar of voters for Yolo County, and artist and community organizer N.J. Vondo about the new interactive healing art project, and we'll get to those interviews in just a few minutes. Lots of news on the COVID front locally. Yolo Public Health announced last week it had appointed a new public health officer if you've heard this before, you're you're not alone. There's There's been a process here. Beginning October 26th, Dr. Amy Sisson will serve as Yolo County's new public health officer following the retirement of Dr. Ron Chapman in June and the terms of two interim officers. She previously served as the public health officer for Placer County and comes to Yolo with a wide breadth of professional experience. She's board certified in public health and general preventative preventive medicine, and licensed by the state of California as a physician and surgeon. And she's trained in epidemiology, which is mighty handy these days, and she teaches graduate students in public health. In addition to Dr. Sisson's formal public health career, she also promotes public health through her passion for urban farming. She views farming as an extension of public health efforts to increase access to healthy and affordable foods, which, of course, is a focus of Yolo County's Health and Human Services Agency. Sounds like a great fit for our largely agrarian county, and I look forward to interviewing her at some point after she gets settled in. Today, we will find out if Yolo County gets to move from the state's restricted Tier 1 purple level to Red Tier 2, under which many more types of businesses could reopen, including gyms and fitness centers, movie theaters, places of worship, and indoor dining at restaurants. Each of these locations would have restrictions as to how many people would be allowed in at any given time. And by the way, nail salons are reopen as of last week. Also, schools could technically resume after two weeks of Yolo County being in the red tier. So far, seven private elementary schools have applied for and received waivers for in-person instruction in Yolo County. No word yet of how public school districts across the county would respond to the opportunity, but really, I think it's a waiting game at this point. Over the last week, Yolo County has averaged about eight new cases per day, according to the county's online dashboard, so we're on the right track. But public health officials are concerned about a post-Labor Day surge, as well as the fact that numbers are on the uptick elsewhere in California. And according to the Davis Enterprise, last week the city of Davis recorded its second COVID-related death since the pandemic began. Uh, The report noted the individual was a woman between the ages of 75 and 84, and the city's previous and only other COVID death, which occurred early in the pandemic, also involved a woman in that age group. And as Chancellor Gary May mentioned in our interview last week, UC Davis continues to test all students moving onto campus. Um, into campus housing and updates its COVID dashboard weekly. As of yesterday, the university reported a total of 79 positive cases total, including 29 students and 52 employees since the pandemic began. With the students back in town as of last week, um, it's it's really a, a waiting game to see what those numbers yield as well. You can view their data at safetyservices.ucdavis. Dot edu slash coronavirus slash covid cases all right let's take a moment for miss biz music and we will be back with our first interview shortly my first guest today is jesse salinas who serves as the assessor clerk recorder, and registrar of voters at Yolo County. I want to acknowledge that his office is responsible for multiple key functions within Yolo County, but today we're going to focus on his role as registrar of voters. Jesse's team has been very busy getting out information about the changes to voting during the November 3rd cycle, and we're glad he's here to get us up to speed. Welcome, Jesse, and thank you for joining us. Hi, Autumn. Thank you for inviting me. You bet. 
So though remote voting and absentee ballots have long been available in California, on May 8th, California Governor Gavin Newsom declared California a vote-by-mail state, and that was to minimize voters' exposure to COVID-19. I'm hoping you'll help us break down what that means for us here in Yolo County. Let's start with if you are not registered to vote or you're not sure you are, what should you do? Well, the first thing you want to do, Autumn, is folks should check the status of their registration mm-hmm. by going online and going to voterstatus.sos.ca.gov. That is the Secretary of State's website. We'll okay. be able to check the status of their registration. And if for some reason they need to uh, change, update their registration or even register for the first time, they can go on to registertovote.ca.gov okay. to do that as well online. Great. And this year, what is the deadline for registering? Well, the deadline we have is October 19th to be able to get you a, a vote, a, a ballot in the mail. So that is our deadline for that process. Of course, in California, there is the ability for folks to even register and vote on Election Day. But we want to encourage people to utilize the vote by mail option because then they can uh, be able to vote at home and uh, have it be very convenient for them. And if they'd like, they can then drop off that uh, envelope with that ballot inside at either a mailbox or one of our drop box locations or even our one of our voter assistance centers. Right. And we're going to talk about all of that in, in just a few minutes. So last week, many of us got a postcard in the mail from um, your office, and we were asked to, uh, it was to check to see if our, our address and our information was correct. And we were asked to return the card. But I saw a lot of chatter on Facebook. Are we supposed to return this card? So are you are you getting those cards back? And is, is that process working? It sure is. We've gotten a lot of those cards returned. And for those that are wondering if, if I forgot to return it or I didn't return it, will that impact the, uh, the ballot that will be coming in the mail to me? No, it will not. This was an opportunity for us to continue to do updating of our database and our, our records. Mm-hmm. And as the saying goes, no news is good news. So if we haven't heard from you, we'll assume that that was the correct address and, and information, and you will be getting your ballot your voter information guide, and your ballot in the mail. Uh, but there were you know, a number of people that sent in updated records for us, which was really helpful moving forward to be able to continue to clean up our data base and our records um, for future elections as well. Sure. We're a mobile population. People move. It happens. And, and we want to get those voters registered. All right. Now, if you are registered to vote, the number one question I'm seeing online is, when do I get my ballot? I got I got the thing from the state, you know, that tells me about the, the propositions, and, uh, and I'm reading up, but when do I get my ballot? So, Okay. So your official ballot will be, we're targeting October 5th mm-hmm. is when it will actually arrive at the West Sacramento Distribution Center. And then from there, it will be distributed out to all voters. So we're expecting... The, the Postal Service is saying expect anywhere from five to ten days for that to arrive in the mail. So, again, if our target date is October 5th, folks should be seeing it later that week um, coming into their mailbox. And if they haven't received it by the end of October 15th, they should contact our office so we can follow up with them. Okay. Do you want to give us a, a phone number or an email there where people can do that, please? Sure, absolutely. So you can. I'm going to give you both so they can... Email us at YOLO Elections. Sorry, I'm sorry, elections at yolocounty.org. Again, elections at yolocounty.org. Okay. That's uh, an easiest email to send it to. Or if they'd like to call in, they can call at 530 666 8133. Great. Okay, just to, to recap that point briefly, if you haven't received your ballot by October 15th, it's probably best to check in with Jesse's office and, and get the status of that so they can get you set up. All right, for the rest of us, my next question is about how and when we return our ballot. And I, I, I want to add two things to that question. The first is that some people are concerned about um, the, the Postal Service and the act of voting by mail. So I'm curious how you're responding to those sorts of questions. Sure. There's a couple of items there. One is we have had conversations with our Postal Service 
Distribution Center and the leadership team here locally. Mm -hmm. We're very fortunate in Yolo County that the actual distribution center is in our county, and uh, they, they cover areas that go all the way up north and all the way to almost down to Fresno, not quite to Fresno, but south of Fresno. So mm -hmm. it's quite an area they cover, but uh, they've assured us that no equipment have been removed from the premises, uh, from this West Sacramento premises, and nor will any of the equipment be removed between now and Election Day. So they have a high level of confidence to be able to to be able to deliver the mail in a timely fashion. Okay. I'd also like to encourage people, if they haven't done this, to, to sign up for Where's My Ballot? It's a ballot track initiative that we have signed up with here in Yolo County, and it's being offered statewide, but you as a voter can go to California.BallotTracks, and there's two T's on that, B-A-L-L-O-T-T-R-A-X dot net forward slash voter, and you can sign up so that you can track your ballot as it comes through our process. So hmm. the nice thing is when you put it in the mail, it'll re be identified as being received by the Postal Service, and we'll give you a, an update that it's been received by the Postal Service. And then as it comes into our office and we've received it, we will scan it and be able to tell you. And you could have either a, an email, uh, a call made to you, or even a text message telling you that this your ballot has been received by our office. And then it'll even tell you once we've processed it and if the signature is verified and it's all being prepared for scanning and, and future tallying and we've completed that process, it'll tell you when that's done. So people can have a high sense of confidence that they've seen where the ballot, their ballot is in the process. And if we have issues, we will reach out directly with the information we have. If there's a signature issue or, for example, if people have forgotten to sign their envelope, that we can reach out to them to make sure we cure that right. matter right. in a timely fashion. Okay, that's a lot of tracking going on, and that's good news. I imagine that will set some minds at ease. Another thing I wanted to mention just real quickly is that uh, voting by mail, uh, no postage is necessary, correct? Correct. Postage is prepaid. We've taken care of all of that. So you okay. just have to put it in the mail, and it will be delivered to us. Great. So no barriers there. Um, before we get into talking about uh, voter assistance centers and, and drop-offs and all of that, I have a couple of um, other questions. Just, just so everyone can be clear, what is a provisional ballot? So a provisional ballot is uh, an option that's available for voters. If there's an issue that uh, there may be some conflict with their registration process. So, for example, and we have some of these in Yolo County because of students. They're a good example of that. If a student has come in and they are um, not necessarily uh, clear in terms of the, the election process, there's an ability for them to always vote provisionally if for some reason they, for example, have put in a, a if they're not sure if they voted in their home, their home residence back at home. Let's say they live in Los Angeles, mm -hmm. as an example. Um, you know, there are some students that aren't quite sure if they voted or not, and they're like, I think I might have voted, vote, <laughs> vote by mail, I don't know if I turned it in or not, <laughs> and so... At that point, we allow them to vote provisionally because we have the ability to check if, in fact, um, they voted already because whatever you cast that first vote is what counts. Right. And if you accidentally, and sometimes people do accidentally cast a second ballot, uh, if they're not already in the system and having identified that that's been uh, processed, we will let them vote provisionally because we don't want to disenfranchise people if they legitimately do have an opportunity to vote. But at the same time, we want to make sure they're not voting twice. Okay. That's what the provisional process allows for. Great. Thank you for explaining that. All right. Let's spend a minute talking about remote accessible vote by mail system, RAVM. Yes. So the remote accessible uh, voting system is really, uh, it, it's designated um, to really provide additional assistance um, for people who may need additional accommodation mm -hmm. and uh, and it's really very helpful in that extent to, for individuals who aren't able to let's say use a uh, standard paper ballot okay. uh, process it also can be used for for folks that are overseas and have unique 
situations where um, they may not have access to certain items that you know, the mail may not work for them. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, they may be deployed, yeah. for example. Yes, yeah. deployed, or they could be in some of the, and this is, again, a uniquely kind of Davis experience that we have students that are maybe studying abroad and maybe in re- very remote regions where they can't have access to to mail getting to them easily. So we need to find other ways of allowing them to be able to vote abroad. So there's lots of uh, unique experiences that we encounter here in, mm-hmm. in Yolo County that we want to make sure those who are eligible to vote still have that opportunity, and that's just another service that we provide as well. Great, and everything we're talking about today, folks, is on the the website um, at yellowcountyelections.org. Do I have that correct? Correct, yeah. yes. All right. Um, before we run out of time here, we have two more important things to talk about. So first, I want to tell you that I am a person who loves to vote. My polling place has always been at at the elementary school my children attended. I love taking them in with me and showing them what voting was about and how important it was. And so, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm definitely, uh, aware of a little loss going on for some of us who really love going in and doing that in person. There will be no neighborhood polling places, but you will have something called voter assistance centers. So what are those uh, and what types of assistance will be offered? Okay, well, thank you, um, Autumn, for sharing that with your your listeners. Yes, we are no longer able to provide um, the neighborhood polling places, and this is as a result of emergency uh, legislation that was introduced. It was first an executive order and then a follow-up legislation to make sure we can provide in-person voting to, to complement the fact that every voter will get a ballot in the mail. And so these uh, these centers that we call voter assistance centers mm-hmm. will be opened up starting Saturday, October 31st through Monday, November 2nd from 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. And so we wanted to make sure that they were before Election Day, that they were open for three days consistent with uh, state law that just recently was passed. Mm -hmm. And, of course, all day Election Day from 7 a.m. to 8 p.m. And the purpose of these locations is to allow people additional days to to walk in and vote. And hopefully, if they want to vote a little early, a few days early, to vote any avoid any lines or crowds that may exist on election day itself right and in addition these centers um, have large large locations so that we can ensure people's safety for purposes Mm -hmm. of of the physical distance requirements that we need to meet as a result of COVID-19 so the locations that we have in Davis and I'm going to quickly go over them because they are very large locations that you'll probably all be familiar with because those who live in Davis have at one point or another probably have heard of these locations or inter- interacted with uh, these community uh, key locations. And the first one is Patwin Elementary School. And so we're going to be using the multi-purpose room. And that's over at 2222 Shasta Drive in Davis. And uh, the other one is Montgomery Elementary School okay. multi-purpose room. And that's at 1441 Danbury Street. And, of course, in the more downtown area, we've got the Veterans Memorial Center, and that's their multi-purpose room. Right. And that's at 203 East 14th Street. And, there, and those all... Go ahead. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. There are a total of... We're, we're about to run out of time, so I, I want to say there are a total of 12 centers throughout the county. Yep. And they're all... Uh, all is uh, Everything's listed on, on the website. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. I I hate to round up our time together because you've just given us a wealth of information. And I know you're an incredibly busy um, person. So thank you so much for coming on and sharing your knowledge with us. We really appreciate it, Jesse. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you for the moment, uh, the opportunity to share this message. All right. Take good care. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Again, that was Jesse Salinas with uh, Yolo Elections. His, one of his roles is as our county's registrar of voters. Go to yoloelections.org for all those sites, for everything we talked about, and I will be back in just a minute with the next interview. All right, again, I really appreciate it. Jesse Salinas coming on and talking about elections with us. Okay, N.J. Vondo is a writer, an artist in music, visual arts, and theater, and a pop-up bookstore owner and community organizer based in Davis, California. 
She curates Multiculturalism Rocks, a blog that celebrates cultural diversity in children's literature. And today we're speaking about her latest effort, the Interactive Healing Art Project here in Davis. Welcome, NJ. Hi, Autumn. Thank you so much for having me on, on the show. Appreciate it. Oh, it's my pleasure. All right. So what is the Interactive Healing Art Project and what moved you to begin putting this together? So the Interactive Healing, Healing Art Project, acronym HAP, is a collaboration between artists and um, community members and the local business owners as well. So we're focusing on healing and um, I'm asking artists what healing looks like to them and the answer, you know, with the major of their choice, whether it's a collage or photography, um, a painting, and um, some people are even making short films. Mm-hmm. Um, so lots of very um, original um, answers, and then those are being shared on businesses' windows uh, downtown, but also outside of the downtown area. And the community members are asked the same question, so they can submit a piece of art, um, but they also, um, we have writing prompts, so we're asking, inviting people to share a word of encouragement for anyone who needs it. And also we are asking, you know, what is a change that they would like to see in the world right this moment. Mm -hmm. So So those answers, yeah, so those answers are printed and plastered or displayed alongside an art piece of artwork on businesses. And we have an online platform as well, a website that will be a virtual gallery where people who cannot, you know, physically leave their house will still be able to be, um, to enjoy the project and to just be a part of it. So it's a community ethos, really. Okay. And you and I have talked about this a little bit before, but what's the impetus behind it? I, we all know there's a lot going on, but, but you had some interesting things to say about why you wanted to bring this to the community. Yes. it's. Um, I've, I've been very concerned about the mental toll um, that all that we're dealing with is, you know, taking on us. So I don't need to name it, but I mean, there is COVID-19. We've been confined since uh, March. We've had to put on masks and limited in a lot of what we can do. Um, we all under a lot of stress for various reasons. We have the, you know, social protests that are going on. We there's some uncertainty about the future, political future. Mm-hmm. Um, lots of lives are being changed because of that. Um, and then just mentally, I think it's important to acknowledge that it, it's tough on us, and we're not all dealing with it. Uh, in the same way, we don't all have access to the same tool. We don't all have access to people who can support us and hear us. And again, as a community, this is a pretty tight um, town. Um, mm-hmm. There is a good sense of community here and around. And I thought it would be um, not just interesting, but very comforting if we're able to hear from each other. And even if you don't know each other, you know, if we're able to to reach out to each other in that way. Uh, I also want to emphasize that art, art, I think, sometimes tends to be undervalued, yeah, um, underlooked, uh, for all the benefits that it actually brings to our life and especially to our mental health. So that was also the, the driving force you know, behind the project, like kind of a, a knowledge art for the place that really has in our life and the fact that, in my humble opinion, we cannot live without it. Like, mm-hmm. if you take out music, if you take out, you know, visual art, etc., I think that we'll all, um, I don't want to say that, you know, I don't know. I don't know how to express it, but it's just going to be very hard on us. We're not yeah. fully going to be ourselves. I no, I, I think you've expressed it well. And you're also, you're really expressing what we talk about in, in Arts Alliance circles about art. Uh, playing the role of second responder, you know, after the crisis, after the the horrible uh, events, um, art has a way of coming in and healing people. So you're you're really walking that that talk here. Um, so what is the timeline, uh, and how do businesses get involved? When does this unfold? Thank you, Thank you for asking that question. So um, right now we are accepting submissions from artists and then from community members, and we're also talking with several business owners. The project is going to, is going live on October 21st, um, and then one week before that, from the 14th, we would like um, to have as many artwork and messages from our community members as possible. Okay. So the website is going live on the 21st. Um, when you walk downtown, you'll be able to see artwork already on several um, businesses' windows. Mm-hmm. Um, but the project itself will go on until the first week 
of January. Okay. So, um, and then during that time, we will keep accepting um, artwork, and we inviting anyone also looking at the art, um, whether online or in person, to send a message. Great. Whatever you know, they have to say. Yeah. So uh, let's let's give the website. It's davishealingartproject.com. That's not quite live yet, but there is a Facebook page and um, event, I believe, by the same name. If you start typing in interactive healing on Facebook, uh, it'll pop right up for you. It did for me today. Yeah. And then uh, can you also tell us uh, the URL for your blog? So Multiculturalism Rocks is a platform that highlights especially voices of color. So we're focusing on how diverse, culturally diverse our world is. And uh, the goal has always been to um, give more visibility Mm -hmm. to um, black, indigenous, and um, creators of color. But uh, also to bring us all together as a community, as opposed to, I feel like sometimes when I read the news media, there is so much division in the way some um, stories are reported Mm -hmm. and in the way our cultures are being portrayed. So we really um, aim to um, just provide more knowledge, but also more fun, and also highlight the wonderful work that is out there. And I know we're at the end of our time together, but I want to give a shout out to all the businesses who already reach out. Um, the Davis Media Access, of course, Sherty, um, Mishka, Stamps Gallery, and many others. I thank you all for supporting this project. Great. And we'll uh, we'll get some of that highlighted in the blog post, too. And Jay, thanks so much for your time and for bringing this work to Davis. We really appreciate it. Thank you, all time, and thank you, Katie Audi. All right. Take care. All right, folks, that is our time for this week. Another episode has gone by, episode 30, oh, I don't know, 37, I think we're at. Uh, this is Autumn Labay Renault live from the KDRT studio. This has been the COVID-19 Community Report.